Hello, welcome to another episode of Wisdom Personified Conversations with Dudum Somi. Today I am talking to an amazing and phenomenal business leader in our country. Her name is Dr. Tash Ismail Seville. She is the CEO of Youth Employment Service called Yes. Tash, how are you? Very good, Dudu. Good to see you this Saturday. Yeah, thank you for making the time out of your very hectic schedule, as always. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your childhood? What was your childhood like? You know, when we see you now, all grown up, you like a very formidable business lady. But what were you like as a child? Uh, do you have siblings? I have two younger sisters, so we three girls. Um, my dad's a gynecologist, so we have a, a very estrogen-filled family. Yeah. <laughs> two daughters. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Women power. Thank you. What were your pre-teen years like? What did you get up to? Very imaginative, very creative, a big reader. Um, I went, uh, you know, those days of apartheid and... Uh, Living in townships was the norm. So I lived in Lanesia and would travel to a convent ah. school. I would travel to a convent school in Parktown every day. And we had a beautiful wood paneled library, you know, the kind, kind you see in, in Harry Potter movies. It was a very special wow. school. It was an yeah. old Herbert Baker building. Mm. And this wood paneled library had a uh, selection of books, all the Enid Blytons, Charles Dickens. And I oh, went, I, I was a, it. yeah, yeah. I was a big reader. So I remember, yeah. I suppose what stands out a lot is going through that, that library from end to end. I read yeah. every Enid Blyton, every, every book in that genre um, <laughs> from the wishing, the wishing chair again through to Enchanted Forest, uh, really believed in fairies a, a little bit longer than was healthy, uh, that they really did exist. Spent a lot of time in the garden, a lot of time swimming. So despite the, the sort of madness of our country, and when you think back that, that we actually lived through that, Despite that madness, I think I, I was in this very um, fantasy-like bubble for many years in my, in my childhood. The, be the beginnings of creativity. Yeah, beginnings of creativity. Um, that's, that's an interesting beginning. Now, as the CEO of Youth Employment Service, what does ES do? So yes, creates opportunities for young people to be able to break into the, the workplace. We, we uh, have a team that goes out into the private sector of the country. We meet CEOs, CFOs, HR people, and we convince them to create these opportunities for young people. And we've worked with the DTI uh, and, and other government departments to build a policy change in the codes of good practice that says to companies who are willing to invest in these work youth work opportunities, you can get a level or two levels up on the BE scorecard. And through this work, we have over 1,200 corporate registrations, and we've been able to create 41,500 work opportunities for youth in about 22 months. So this is 2.3 billion in salaries that goes directly into youth wallets. And we're really wow. proud of this number. Yeah. And uh, wow. my team have managed to create these jobs across the country. So we have jobs in the Northern Cape, in the Eastern Cape, in Mpumalanga and KwaZulu-Natal. Uh, and we, we have some corporate partners who are really dedicated to creating incredible opportunities that break, break young people in. Amazing. Well done for that, eh? And uh, more strength to you as you go forward. Um, there's an interview you did in 2018 where you mentioned that out of about a million 
youth that are entering the labor force each year, about 56% do not have a matric certificate. What profile of work can such uh, individuals get realistically if we look at uh, the fact that the world is increasingly technologically driven? Yeah, it's a, I'm, I'm glad you highlighted that, you know, Dudu, because in, in, in our country, we tend to place a huge amount of emphasis on grad unemployment. And if you yeah. look at the pool of grads, actually, they only make up about 2% of the unemployed. Mm -hmm. So if you get uh, training and education, it is far more likely that you will get absorbed into the workforce. If you look at yeah. COVID, those with training, those more, uh, uh, the, the more grad type young person was able to move into virtual work. We're doing our interview virtually. And you see that a lot of those young people were able to switch quite quickly into virtual work. They had the hardware, they had the Wi-Fi, they have the types of jobs that enable them to do that. And uh, COVID hit this group that you're describing, which is youth with no matric certificate who tend to work in more physical jobs that are only doable face to face. Um, so the problem that you're describing got worse during COVID. Now, I do want to say that, that YES is trying to place youth in a wide range of opportunities. And we, we say to companies, you know, create openings for young people that might not have a grad certificate, but there are lots of ways that we can train them on the job to be able to work their way into uh, uh, being capable in that position. Because not having a matric certificate very often doesn't have anything to do with that young person's potential. It's actually got a lot more to do with the access they've been given. So if you can get a young person into a job and create a pathway for them where they can build through a series of micro credentials, um, that, that capability, we, we believe that there are a lot more jobs available to these young people than, than otherwise the, the economic data would suggest. So if you get a young person yeah. in and we've got, we've got partners like IT Varsity, where they're training youth with almost no qualifications in the tech space. And within three to six wow. months, they've got these youth learning how to code, learning how to build websites, apps, um, and, and, and so we believe that if you get the youth into the right opportunity with the right training, you can actually start to get them geared up uh, for a 4IR career um, if you start that work quite early. Yeah, I must say, as you're saying that, Tash, now, for some of us who are qualified and graduates, steering into the coding world and, you know, that um, uh, building uh, applications, for us, it's more difficult than somebody actually who hasn't been trained in a particular discipline. My CMO likes to, to use this term. Um, she, she always says youth are, 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 are native, digitally native. They take to it very quickly. And, uh, and, and so if you do start them off young, you know, they learn it like a language quite fast. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and it is a language, you know, it really is a language. And you can start to build ways to drive that creativity. This really is, it's not just about the coding. It's how do you also harness the natural creativity and the tech uh, that, that, and you put those two together and it's quite a magic combination. Now, look, having said that we are trying to promote a lot of jobs where the tech capability is coming through, we also have really exciting jobs. I mean, COVID hit us quite hard in Mpumalanga, but we've got youth in beautiful rhino protection programs and game ranging programs. And in the hospitality and tourism sector, there are a large number of jobs where that matric certificate is not critical. We've got youth yeah. in KwaZulu-Natal who are clearing non-Indigenous species um, of, of plants out of an area, getting into farming jobs. We're pushing a lot in agri, but agri with technology, so agri tech jobs. Um, if you look at one of our partners, Nestle, very exciting circular economy model, where youth are clearing non-indigenous wattle out of this farmland, it's cattle farmland. Yes. They're opening up the waterways because they're clearing this wattle, but then they turn yeah. the wattle into cattle feed. And wow. Nestle buys the cattle feed for the dairy farms. So it's a, it's a beautiful model where if you just think through yeah. the elements, you can create mm. sustainable livelihoods even in rural communities.
I mean, I just didn't think that your interventions are that expensive. I'm very excited to hear that. But you started off being a qualified dentist at, um, from the Vitz Medical School. And uh, you ran a successful surgical dental practice for a few years. What made you get into business? So I, I think it wasn't about getting into business. It was about being able to apply my mind in, in uh, creative ways. I, I have to say I loved studying medicine. It's, the human body is fascinating. Anatomy, pathology, physiology, I loved it. But once you actually get into practice, into private practice, and you're seeing one patient at a time, you, you don't yeah. really have, I, I didn't feel like I was having the impact or I was using my brain in the way it was built for. <laughs> and so I started by doing a whole lot of UNISA courses, non-degree courses. And Dudu, I mean, I, I really played around. I did everything from classical civilization and development studies and uh, and, and I went all the way through into things like financial maths and quantitative analysis. So really, you know, getting a, a broad sense of what was That's a broad, yeah. And uh, yeah. so I, I must say those UNISA courses were pretty, were pretty exciting uh, for anybody who wants to dabble. Although now, you know, this was way back then. Now you've got a beautiful range of online courses that you can retrain yourself. I'm at the yeah. moment, I'm doing one on behavioral science. I'm actually doing two, one on behavioral science and one on digital marketing. Uh, but you really mm -hmm. can upskill yourself in amazing ways with what's available online. I then I, I, I said to my dad at that time, because I had to say to him, look, I'm leaving practice. Uh, I want to do an MBA because that's going to give me the best sort of stepping stone into the world where I think I can use my mind in the way I'd like and have the impact I want. And I had his... Uh, he said, great idea. And I won the Gibbs scholarship. And I thought, okay, I'm oh, getting signs. Wow. <laughs> I'm getting yeah. signs that, uh, that this is the right path. And when I was at the business school, I really fell in love with innovation and economics. Uh, I had amazing lecturers. And um, the business school asked me to stay on to do a European Union research project on global innovation networks. And that just took me deep into this world of global innovation and competitiveness, which was fascinating for three years working on that European Union study with about 12, 12 countries and researchers and businesses from across the world. So we looked at Brazil, India, China, and South Africa. And we looked at uh, uh, nine European countries. And we looked at the innovation networks that crisscross the globe and allow for ideas to be connected and how that drives industry and, and innovation. Uh, and um, yeah, I took on a lecturing role there as well and, and really started yeah. to get the impact that I wanted. Your brain works very broadly. I mean, it's exciting to me because I, I get interested and excited about different disciplines. I can get into decor, I can get into hospitality, I can get into things that I, I have no idea of, but I get, get excited. With a brain like that, what vision did you have for your life? And is it working out the way you envisioned? Absolutely. You know, if your heart is open, if you, if you I, I really believe that if you are working towards the greater good and you just keep an open mind, there's a path for you. It comes. You just have to be open-minded and the opportunities come. And I started to work on inclusive business. So in terms of the impact I wanted to have, inequality worries me. I don't like inequality. I feel like people should be given a chance. And in my work at Gibbs, Nick Benadel, the dean at the time, allowed me to start a unit at Gibbs called the Inclusive Markets uh, uh, Unit. And I worked with companies from around the world. I wrote beautiful research uh, uh, and case studies on understanding how you could take the IP, the intellectual property, the resources, the skills that sit in the private sector, and how you could just tweak and model them so that they would have positive impacts on society, uh, grow small businesses, give people a chance in low-income communities to become more prosperous uh, in terms of the way that large organization connected with them. And this idea of how you take a big business 
and build the networks that allow it to operate with a really strong value proposition that meets people's needs in communities. And we see amazing examples on the continent of how this has changed people's lives. If you look at Vodafone, they have um, a, a, a subsidiary in Kenya called Safaricom. Safaricom is huge in yeah. East Africa. And innovators in that company came up with M-Pesa, which was one of the first global uh, remittance, digital remittance systems on a phone. And in those days, they would use really the dumb phones, not the smartphones we use now. And in a very short space of time, a company with company innovation had, had changed the lives of millions of Kenyans by giving them yes. access to financial services. Now, when I say change the lives, you're going to say, well, how does, a, how does a remittance system change lives? So we know we live in a very patriarchal society in Africa. And women have very few rights in communities. If a male family member walks into a home, he can demand whatever cash a woman or a, a grandmother has been saving. And that, that money disappears. With M-Pesa, women started taking that cash and storing it in a virtual space where it was safe. And so what you saw was not just this access to financial services, but you saw a host of female entrepreneurs mushrooming because they were able to start wow. saving the capital to start their businesses. Um, you know, cell phone towers and, and being able to connect on these devices has been the greatest democratizer that our continent has seen. In fact, there's a lot of, of, of research, economics research, that shows that by connecting a person into a digital network with 100 other phones, you drive GDP per person by 1.8%. Is that measurable? Oh, my gosh. That's measurable. That is measurable data. And it's old. It's 2009, 2010 data. You can imagine today. Access to yeah. a phone is giving you access to learning. I mean, on my phone, I can show you that I started learning how to code. There's a little app that I downloaded that was recommended to me, uh, Mimo. And on this yeah. little app on my phone, uh, and here it is, here's this, here's this app. I've yeah. been learning how to code HTML. Um, I've been learning how to code a website. And, um, you, you know, at, at my age, this is what this phone is, is making me capable of. You can imagine for young people across the continent, you can yes. credential yourself, you can transact, you can save, you can get loans, you can um, uh, run a business off this device. Yeah. And none of that was possible before. Yeah, you're making it very practical. I mean, I think some of us use these devices and we have these capabilities, but I don't think we actually look at it in that simpler terms of how it's actually impacting other lives that otherwise would not have been impacted. You also co-authored a book called you, you, New Markets and New Mindsets. Uh, which examines successful business practices and strategies in developing markets. What is the main take-home wisdom you want readers to get when they buy this book? So this, I mean, it's a 2012 book, and it was um, looking at all the models we'd seen globally and the companies that I was working with in my consulting work, companies we were working with at Gibbs um, that we'd been studying, and looking at the way in which they were innovating new models as they entered market spaces that they were not accustomed to serving. And what were the, the, the rules, the frameworks that you needed to adopt to be able to do this successfully? And what is that definition of success? The definition of success is that the business is able to grow with a value proposition that adds real, real uh, value into a community, into a household, and really fulfills people's needs. So you're benefiting the community and you're benefiting the company at the same time. So it was this idea of a, of a win-win scenario for both. And, it, and it, it, it captures the frameworks that you need to think about and apply in order to achieve that. You've traveled quite a journey in this life thus far. Um, what wisdom have you learned about yourself and the world that you will tell your 16 year old self my 16-year-old self was, um, was a real softie, 
was, you know, I would I would tell myself to not take things so heavily into your own heart. Um, you know that 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 there's this too shall pass. Always yeah. understanding that uh, that the, the universe has big, wide open pathways for you. Uh, don't worry too much about what people say. If you want to mm. achieve things and you want to get somewhere, you've got to have a determination and a strength of mind uh, to get there. And and that's going to upset certain people along the way. Uh, but yeah. it's, but 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 keep that sense of purpose, uh, and and that is what will get you there. I think I'm very driven yeah. today by a sense of purpose, uh, and and. Um, and that's what's kept me kept me going. In that context, what do you think your unique value proposition is? If tomorrow you are not here, how would we be poorer for not having you in our world? You know, I, 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 don't, I don't see myself as irreplaceable, to be honest, Dudu. I think that's, that the lesson is that the world goes on with or without you. Uh, you know, I, I, I hope my kids would miss me. <laughs> <laughs> but I, think that, uh, I think we have amazing, amazing people out there. And my mindset is not unique. I think there are people out there who have similar desires to, to successfully change the, the, the world that we live in. Um, and and I, I really don't think I'm an indispensable member of the, the human race. <laughs> And uh, I, I don't know. I think there would be people that would fill my role quite quickly. Um, yeah. Um, when you get into a space, though, great. what makes you memorable and impactful? What, what makes me think Tash is in this space? Tash does not give up. She, she is, if, if there is a purpose, purpose-driven end point, uh, this is someone, and I'm quoting my husband because this is an awkward question to answer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but he would he would say this is someone who, if there is an outcome that is uh, purpose led, that is important, uh, she will push with determination yeah. to make it happen. Yeah. You kind of have an undermining strength. As a person can look at you, I think the softness that you had is still there. And, I, you know, from observing you from a distance, a person can undermine you. But I do see that very, uh, you, you're very strong. You have that resilience. And I suppose that purpose that drives you also gives you that armor. What is the one decision you wish you had never made in life and why? I've, I've made I've made mistakes. Uh, I have made my fair share of mistakes, but I, it's it's funny. I never wish that I hadn't made them, because there's such incredible lessons uh, that have that have come. You know, I'm I'm quite a. I mean, I suppose something I should mention about myself in in terms of when you say what will we miss, uh, my team at work. I think enjoy my ability to connect ideas. Uh, this is the, the age of the generalist. <laughs> and, and I think ah, and, and I keep on I saying that. that I used to say that all the time. It's our era. <laughs> yeah, you, you need you need curious people that can learn very quickly about different subject matter area, but, but areas, but then have this ability to connect those dots yeah. and put them together in a way that adds value and solves a problem. Uh, yeah. And you don't get that ability if you've been in a cushioned bubble and you haven't made mistakes. The, mm. the learning, the resilience, the ability to connect ideas comes from trying a whole lot of things, messing up, connecting it a different way, and not being afraid to really see that big, big, big picture and take those risks. So if you're constantly going to be regretting mistakes you've made, um, you just develop a mindset that is so risk averse. You will never be able to create that next great thing uh, that takes our planet forward, that takes our race forward. Um, so, so I say, viva the, the mistakes <laughs> and, and, and always appreciate your mistakes because they, they tell you you're the type of person that is growing. 
and learning. Yeah. And, and don't learning. dwell in them, but just like grow through them. Um, what would you suggest white collar workers do to stay competitive in a world of artificial intelligence? Yeah, I, I, and that's such a great question because we, ha we, we have no excuses today. We have no excuses today to, to not download apps that teach us how to code, uh, teach us about blockchain, um, go into behavioral sciences. There are at any one point in time, you go online, there is so much available to you. Uh, figure out what these, these new age ways of, and, and the new age subjects integrate different subject matter, different disciplines. So if you're looking at behavioral science, it's integrating biology, economics, neuroscience, and it's putting those together in a way that you understand the world a little bit better. And go wide, you know, don't hone yourself into little rabbit holes. Go wide and build a spectrum of, of broad knowledge areas. And then you, when you have projects, you can go deeply into each one, but you won't see the connections and ability to apply those solutions if you haven't gone wide enough. But what I can say is do it. Don't wait. Yeah. Don't say I'm going to do it later. I'm, I, I had the privilege of interviewing uh, a, a woman called Christine Williams, in, uh, who's a Canadian um, uh, charter director. So she sits on boards today. But she came into Canada as a 22-year-old immigrant. She'd lost her dad when she was 16 in the Caribbean. And she came into Canada as an immigrant and rose to be VP of, of, a, of a big Canadian bank, very white male dominated type of industry. And when I tracked her journey, because I tried to put together a recipe book of, of, of how women can advance, particularly women of color can advance in, in societies. And it was, it was your question. It was, what did she learn? And she would sign herself up. She would create a learning plan every year, a vision board with her heroes on that vision board and where she wanted to be. And she would create a learning plan for all the courses that she would do over that period of time to get there. And when she looked at boards, when she looked at boards in, in Canada, she said, the, these are important places where important decisions are made. And I don't see myself represented there. And her plan was to study her way onto those boards. And she's gone to the best business schools, Ivy and Rotman. Um, and and uh, she's almost overachieved, <laughs> you know, overqualified for the position now. Um, yeah. but, but everybody can do it. Yeah, we'll, we'll still put our Gibbs Business School up there. <laughs> That's enough to get me through any, any, any door at this stage. Um, you have a blended family with Dr. Adrian Saville, my one of the best professors I've ever come across. He's still my favorite human being. What ingredient I do you... I have to agree. <laughs> what also my favorite professor. <laughs> and your favorite hubby and only hubby. <laughs> what ingredient do you see as essential from your experience to increase the success of blended families? I think you've got to build uh, good relationships with your ex. Uh, I think that's a, that's a critical piece. I have a really good relationship with, with, with my ex-husband. Um, I think this is the one. The second piece is understand that it's hard. You're dealing with children here uh, and, and children uh, don't have the maturity they, they are, they are kids, they, they forming their opinions on the world. So it's, it's about patience and, and maintaining good relationships with people and not yeah. expecting that this is easy, <laughs> yeah. especially when you have teenage children, expecting that this is not easy, but you can't be the child in it. Great advice. Um, just before we close, uh, uh, what's on your bucket list still to do? I think from an impact perspective, there's more that I can do. Um, you know, I, I think that the impact that we need to have as South Africans, we can't just say we want South African impact. I think we've got to think about our continent. We've got to think about other developing countries. We've got to, we've got to build a lot better uh, and innovate a lot harder because the, the, the developing world is still an incredibly unequal place. 
on a planet that is building electric cars and trying to figure out how to fly to Mars, uh, the fact that we still have people in our country and continent and other developing markets living in homes that are still almost, you know, in the second industrial revolution where they don't have electricity. And, and yet our part of the economy is, 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 is thinking about interplanetary travel. Uh, we've got a long way to go in terms of, of leveling the playing field and giving people a chance to be able to also fly to Mars with us. Thank you. Um, and in closing, uh, what's the last um, granule of wisdom you want to leave us with? That if I love this part when I say this is your last conversation you ever have, <laughs> what would you want us to think about and and really live? Don't waste it. Don't don't waste the opportunity that your privilege gives you to be able to make change. We we still we have a long way to move as a as a species um, around the way we interact with each other and interact with our planet. And I think we are still, especially in our country, the the racial tension, the way we treat each other. Um, the lack of common good in, 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 in our beings. Um, and and if, you, if you leave this planet and you haven't made a contribution and had a mindset of the common good, I feel that it is a life wasted because when you have the privilege to make a difference and you squander that, it's a great pity. Gosh, hey, we could go on for a long time. This has been one of the most uplifting and spiritually and uplifting conversation I've had. I hope you've enjoyed it too. And uh, until next time, thank you. Please don't forget to subscribe. And for future notifications, please press the bell so that you are the first one to know.